You're listening to Airy Bros Radio. Be there or be square, because it's all killer, no filler. We think that everybody should have their own freedoms to do whatever they feel they should do, whatever best for their themselves and their family. I'm okay with what you're doing. Hopefully you can be okay with what we're doing. It's something that you know, punk rock has always been about. Each person in this band is just so amazing at their instrument as well as, you know, what their their idea of what this band is supposed to sound like. If there was one sort of global message, it's basically, you know, unity as a whole. There's a story there from the first hit, the first lyric to the very last thing you hear. There's, there's definitely a thread. I don't know. There's something pretty special happened when we when we started making music this is a monster you guys are making something crazy here hey this is greg camp and you are listening to the airy bros radio thanks for taking the time to talk to us today this uh, really means a lot and the research i did kind of going into this interview i didn't realize how much of my childhood you were a part of being being the guy who wrote all the songs for smash mouth and, and all the the music you have created throughout the year so so thank you for that and thank you for all, all the epic tunes you have given us throughout the years well thank you very much for saying that and thanks for listening all these years I, at first it sounded a little creepy that i was part of your childhood being, <laughs> being that i'm probably much older than you <laughs> well i i think that's um that's a good starting point is i so i was listening to some podcasts and some interviews of you just kind of you know to touch up and to see and and the one thing you said is you know going in, into smash mouth you know you you were a songwriter and you know you want to stay punk rock and then you know kind of getting into all those movies and stuff you didn't want to be be a sellout but then when the royalty checks came in you had it had a different tune tune <laughs> about that so how um how did all all that change for you from you know be, being so so into the music and then realizing oh wow i made a i made a career out of this and this is something that keeps on paying off every time you get a royalty check well i mean yeah back then if you if you're songs were in a movie or in a especially in a commercial or something like that you're definitely you know blacklisted from any sort of credibility or any sort of community you know below pop music you know and so um it, it was sort of a i don't know it, it just wasn't the best idea back then we thought but looking back it's really these days the only way you can make money unless you want to go out on the road every day of the year and try to sell t-shirts and try to sell stuff merchandise so um i think that you know some of the bands sort of followed suit after that and they're like oh man i guess i guess we should probably do that too because now everyone's ripping off music and streaming for free and we're broke you know so anyway it, it hurt at the time but I'm, I'm glad we made that decision now I, I heard you say that the guys that kind of got you into Smash Mouth were kind of hustlers for a lack of a better term. Do you think that they they saw the business end of things and that's kind of why you guys went in that direction? Definitely they saw the business end. That's what they were. They were business guys. And they um, you know, they put the band together to make money. You know, it's really what what they were doing. They weren't exactly musicians to begin with. They became, you know, musicians and artists in their own right. Um, but when they were doing it, they were just kind of like, let's go, let's get ourselves a record deal and make a bunch of money and go on tour and meet girls is really was the plan, you know? So yeah, they definitely, especially Steve Harwell, you know, he was the mastermind behind the whole thing. You know, he, he, it's kind of like building a car, you know, he's like, all right, this car has, you know, wheels, but it, it doesn't have a motor, you know, or it doesn't have a steering wheel or a something you know and so he sort of put all those pieces together and and made this band greg was there was that a, a big debate within the band or uh, in terms of making that decision to do that or was it kind of maybe a what? little bit of, you mean to sell out <laughs> i wouldn't <laughs> I, I wouldn't call it that but um <laughs> well these days there's probably no such thing as selling out you know because exactly these days, these days it's called making a living yeah but um 
it, I was definitely kicking and screaming about it. Um, I don't know if I was the only one kicking and screaming about it, but I was kicking and screaming the loudest. Um, and being the songwriter, you know, I felt like I had, you know, a little more skin in the game just because I wasn't ready to have songs that I wrote that were, you know, in my mind, heartfelt and, you know, meant something to be in a Pizza Hut commercial. You know, I was like, no, that's not what this is about. But, um, you know, after, after seeing, you know, what it could do and that it made a lot more people smile and especially getting the Shrek thing and watching these kids going crazy over something that I, you know, wrote in my garage, I was like, oh, okay, that feels pretty good. Do you have children? I do. I have three. And and do they know that your your song is in Shrek? And how does, <laughs> it, how does that hold up? Do they uh, do they have you on a pedestal? Not at all. They don't care. No. <laughs> it's actually kind of annoying because you know that the song All Stars like everywhere you go. You know, we walk into the grocery store, it's on. You walk into karaoke, it's on. You know, my kids go to school and they go to a dance and it comes on and everyone looks at them and points and you know. No, they're they. I'm sure they're proud, but you know they're teenagers, and so they're like, "Get out of here, Dad." Yeah. One day they'll 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 appreciate it, and they'll be they'll be bragging about it. Right. <laughs> like it's the gift that keeps on giving. It keeps the it keeps the lights on. It keeps the it keeps their iPad on. You know. Yeah, no doubt. So we came across the Defiant because we had John Joseph on the podcast earlier in the summer and we were talking about you know bands that are, are true to punk rock and and stay true to punk rock and he said hit up the defiant Th those guys they're holding it down they're they're doing the punk rock thing they're one one of the few where did you kind of co come on to that because we know how the band kind of formed but some of the other guys getting kicked out of their band because of some political things and stuff like that how did you kind of get towards that group well, you know, before I get into that, that's uh, pretty flattering that John Joseph said that because, you know, I'm a fan. It's it's kind of strange how it all came together, but and that we were all pretty aligned in a lot of ways. You know, for one thing, a lot of us, um, you know, didn't get jabbed and weren't going to. And but at the same time, it was more like it's a medical freedom and we don't care if you do, but hopefully you're okay if we don't was base is kind of like our stance on the whole thing um that was sort of like almost secondary you know um the music part of it came along you know our our good friend joe sib who's a comedian and he also ran sidewind dummy records along with bill armstrong um we've known him for years and years and years just kind of called me one day and he's like hey you know dickie barrett and i said yes and he said give him a call you know, he could probably use a friend right now. So gave him a call. We started talking. We actually joked a few years back about get, putting a band together. Um, and then all of a sudden it started happening. Um, you know, I turned a couple songs into him and Pete Parada, um, who was also ousted from his band, um, The Offspring. And uh, Dickie brought on... Um, Johnny Rio from Street Dogs and I brought on Joey LaRocca from the Briggs and all of a sudden a band was formed. We all sort of had the same ideas. We all had children. We all, some of us homeschool, um, but uh, we just had a lot of the same ideals, I guess, you know, so it, it's a beautiful thing. We wrote about 25 songs in about four months and recorded them and whittled it down to 10 or 12 and had an album had an album ready to roll out which is coming out on october 27th this month next week baby that's right can't wait yeah we're very stoked for it so we had we had johnny on last week talking to him about uh, and i heard you mention it as well on i think it was on the defiant website about how everyone kind of built their piece on their own end in their own location. And then they sent them to you. Um, did you produce all the tracks? I didn't produce the tracks, but you know, it, everyone sort of produced their own track individually. I would say that I assembled the record and mm -hmm. 
you know, along with um, Dicky as our, you know, fearless captain. It's just kind of like he he's just such a he's got such a musical mind and a musical ear that you know, he catches things that a lot of, a lot of us didn't, you know, he's like, Hey, what if you did this instead of that? And we're like, huh, never thought of that. And so I think kind of all together, we produced this album. Um, I say, I, I assembled it in my studio. So they would send their parts to me and I would, you know, do all the editing and putting everything together and, you know, putting effects on things and that kind of stuff. And then um, TJ Rivera, um, over at Shipwreck, uh, which is Tim Armstrong's studio, uh, mixed everything, and all of a sudden, it sounded like an album. And as a musician, was that process was that kind of a new experience for for you, or, or is that something that's kind of been around for for a minute? I, I've done this many many times, but not with this uh, level of you know artists. I think that each person in this band is just so amazing in their own right at, at each uh, you know the, at their instrument as well as you know what their their idea of what this band is supposed to sound like and I, most of the time or most of the bands that i've been in um you know it's either i'm writing all the songs or i'm playing all the instruments or you know i'm producing it but i didn't get the pr production credit <laughs> you know just it's always been that way. I've always had a studio. I spend way too many hours on each little part, you know? Um, so, you know, but that's my role. You know, everyone in this band has a role and that's, that's mine. And you said about how the, the band kind of come together and, you know, you guys didn't get jabbed. So that was a, a big part of, of what brought you guys together, but is there a message behind this album or is it just, you know, five guys who really like punk rock and good music got together and, you know, giving us some good tunes. Yeah, There's definitely messages. I would say it's not like one, you know, if there was one sort of global message, it's basically, you know, unity. Uh, it's something that, you know, punk rock has always been about. It's, you know, questioning authority and it's like not, doing what you're told but at the same time uh you know kind of what we're saying is like you know we we think that everybody should have their own freedoms to do whatever they feel they should do what's ever best for their themselves and their family um and that doesn't always you know work some people are like well what's best for my family is for you to get fucking jabbed you know and we're like well that's not best for me or my family so i guess we'll just agree to disagree but you know i'm okay with what you're doing hopefully you can be okay with what we're doing it i think that's sort of like the the all-around message here but each song and it was very carefully you know if you listen to the album and as a whole and hopefully you do um you'll there's a story there and I'm not going to spoil it until the album comes out, but there is a, like a, a story and there's a thread that kind of goes through the entire, from the first hit, the first lyric to the very last thing you hear. There's, there's definitely a thread. I think the last interview I, I heard of you was like a year or two ago. And I think that's before the Defiant kind of came together. And in that interview, you said you really liked composing and you were kind of, I wouldn't say you said you were over bands, but that was kind of the most rewarding thing for you at that point. Has that changed? Do you still like composing and doing stuff for, for uh, television and, um, and stuff like that? Or are you enjoying kind of the band dynamics of things again? I'm definitely enjoying the band thing right now. Um, and it sort of came at a great time. The music supervisor at the company that I'm with um, ended up one day, just saying, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to go do something else. And so for years and years, this person was my music supervisor and was getting me these uh, composing gigs and spots and bumpers. And, you know, I've scored a few films here and there. And then once she was gone, I was like, huh, okay. Well, I am, you know, I don't really feel very competitive right now, especially with, you know, there are like billions and billions and billions of people out there that can, do you know, they can't do what i do but they they can do it you know and so i decided just to 
you know, ride the rest of it out and finish up what I, what we had uh, started together. And all of a sudden the defiant happened and that started taking up a lot of my time. Um, and then um, some other things have fallen into my lap that I've really been really enjoying this developing and writing and producing um, young artists. So that that's kind of what takes up a lot of my time when defiance not happening. And, and with the defiant happening, I know you guys the 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 punk scene is 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 a fairly small circle relatively speaking to the the grand scheme of things. Were you were you guys all at least at the very least known each other and been friendly with each other, or were some new friendships formed through this? Um, I guess super group, if you will. A little of both. Um, yeah. Joey Larocca and I have, have known each other for many years. Um, our kids are our best pals. Um, I met Dickie years ago on the road. And then kind of reconnected with him when he was at Kimmel and uh, Joey and Dickie and I would sometimes see each other at the park and our kids would be playing. And that's when we would joke about having a dad band someday. <laughs> and, um, and then uh, uh, Pete Parada, I just met, you know, when this whole thing started, like, you know, a year and a half ago and same with Johnny, I'd never met them before, but it's crazy how quickly, even before we were in the same room, I felt like I knew those guys and uh, you know, once we all got together and he clicked it off one, two, three, four, it sounded like we'd been in a band since high school. It was just something very magical. Now, have you had anything like that in a while? Cause I, I know, you know, I don't want to say there was a divide with you and some of the guys in smash mouth, but just listen to some interviews of you. It kind of seemed like you were kind of doing your own thing and then you would go back to smash mouth when you knew they weren't going to do things the way you wanted to do them and you kind of wanted it to be represented it the right way because it was your band is this something new for you again definitely um you know i've been in bands that had the same sort of you know connection um but it's mostly it's usually just from like old friends like you know people i've known since i was a teenager you know we put bands together in our later years and you know that that was kind of a different thing but with these guys um it's i don't know there something pretty special happened when we when we started making music and we all knew it and anyone who's who was listening to it along the way was like going oh shit this is a monster you guys are making something crazy here so haven't felt it in a long time curious with with the band's kind of stance on on some things and and sort of the the pushback or the blowback that caused the original formation of the band with with the songs that have come out have have some people come around have 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 you been well received and and have some people maybe come back and maybe apologized <laughs> there nobody needs to apologize for anything sure you know, there, there's no there, i mean it was just it was time for me to move on you know when when it sort of when it when it left my con I was never in control of anything, but I did believe that Smash Mouth had a brand and I was fiercely protecting it. And so when somebody in the band or in the organization said, Hey, we're going to do some country songs now, or we're going to go make some pop music, like the over the top, we're going to go get some other songwriters and just, you know, start cranking out number one hits every few months. And I'm like, well, okay but can we keep the formula, you know, like this, you know, the way the brand is supposed to sound. And they're like, Oh no, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to, you know, use all these, you know, modern sounds and this and that. And I just, it just never, I tried it for a minute and I'm like, this is not, I'm not, I'm no longer necessary here because this isn't my, this isn't what I do. And so I stepped out. And every once in a while, it was really fun to go back and play a show with them or, you know, I still hang out with them, you know, when I can, you know, we live in different states, but, you know, uh, whenever they're close enough, I go see them. I even get up on stage and play with them if they're close enough. Um, so it's not, it's not like we hate each other. We, I don't think we ever did. If we did, it, it wasn't like a, a long lasting forever spat, you know? Kind of like siblings. Exactly. We always were like that anyway. We fought like brothers for sure. Yeah. And you're, you're in Nashville now, yeah? Yes, sir. Have you been there um, 
for a while? Um, a little over three years. Okay. So was it was it the um the madness of March of twenty twenty that that caused <laughs> sparked the move? Or well, we yeah move? we 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 stuck it out. My family and I stuck it out for a while, and um, just when the when the divide happened, you know, between you know friends and even family, you know, they're like, well, I I can't be with you anymore if you don't get jabbed. And I'm like, I totally understand. Um, there wasn't enough friends and family for us to stay where we were living at the time in California. And so we got ourselves uh, an RV and hit the road and we were on it for about a year and a half, um, just cruising around the country and, you know, visiting everywhere. We, I mean, we went, we went across the U S a couple of times and we ended up in, uh, in Nashville. And then we went out for about another three months and, couldn't find anything that beat Nashville, so we came back, and here's where we are planted. You're California born and raised, yeah? Yeah, I am. Was that tough? Do you miss it? I miss the beach. Yeah. You know, we're pretty far away from the ocean. That's a bummer, but I've uh, I've resorted to lakes and rivers. <laughs> so, yeah, they're not too bad. Not too bad at all. With Nashville being kind of a, a music town, and I, I know there's a lot of stuff that goes down there, but you had spoke on on kind of California. You know, you go to the studio, you get the songs done. Nashville, it's kind of on on more of a professional type level. You know, we're, we're here for three hours, and then we'll come back and, and get the songs done. And you weren't kind of feeling that. Has that changed for you, or are you still kind of keeping to your own own out there and not really feeling the vibe as far as writing music with people? Yeah, I mean, I love writing music with, with people. It's just that I don't want to walk into a room with strangers um, for three hours, three times a day, five days a week like some people do do here and some people love that and some people know how to do that and some people are really good at that and i'm just i can't turn a faucet on and off like that i it's like you know when when lightning is striking i'm in my studio and i'm catching it hopefully and uh you know a lot of times that doesn't happen when when someone else is standing next to me and so you know for me what i what I really like to do is either start something and present it to somebody, you know, in an email or and say, Hey, what do you think of this? And then have them shoot back some, their thoughts. And then if it's working, then we'll get together and we'll flesh it out and make it a song. So that's, that's kind of the way I like to work. Where, where do you draw inspiration from? Gosh, I, I think it's just anything everywhere. You know, I, I don't know if I believe the, you know, I, I'm reading Rick Rubin's book and, sometimes sometimes i'm like wow he's like the messiah and then sometimes i'm like nah i'm not feeling that and i think that's like any you know artistic or creative person's going to feel that way you know that everything is kind of floating around up in the ether and if you're available it'll come to you and you can catch it and the song's already written and you all you need to do is realize it i don't know if i believe that but sometimes songs come to me fully formed and i don't know why Okay. So, have you ever worked with Rick? I haven't. I've never met him. Do you have any goals? Anything that you want to do? I know you said it's kind of, you know, you like to be professional about it and, and stay on it. But do you have any goals as a mu musician that you haven't accomplished? Oh, um, I do want to do a children's record at some point. I I sort of started doing it a few years ago, and and it, it just didn't feel. I don't know. I think I was still pissed off. And so I, I didn't feel like I could do it. Um, I think my heart is softening a little bit. And so hopefully there'll be a time. So yeah, I, do, I really do want to do a, a children's record, a fun one though, like not corny, cheesy cornball stuff, but something fun and something kind of sarcastic and educational, <clears throat> but poking fun at stuff is, is my goal. Did like winning awards for Smash Mouth and your songs, did that ever do anything for you? Was that like a pat on the back? Was that, you know, you achieved something or was that not why you got into it? So it really wasn't that big of a deal. It's not why I got into it, but I do remember 
um, winning a BMI award and they kind of put this medallion, this big old medallion around your neck. And I remember going like, wow, this is, this is kind of cool, you know, and I'm not going to mention a name, but I did walk up to someone else who you guys would probably know. And, um, and I'm like, Hey, how's it going? And he's like, not as good as going for you. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And they had a hit on the radio at the time. And he, he didn't write this. They didn't write the song. They had an outside person come in and they were super pissed off about it. And I do remember feeling bad for them, but also feeling a little empowered and kind of stoked to do it again, you know, and, and hopefully go even bigger, like go for the Grammy or something like that, which we got nominated for, but, but lost. Does that happen a lot, Greg? Do, 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 do people not realize that as much as it is that other people are writing songs for people? I don't know if people realize it or not, but you know, I don't think I ever did when I was a kid growing up, you know, I, any song I heard on the radio, I'm like, wow, that guy wrote it. That's a really cool song that guy made, you know, or that girl. So now I don't know how, how, you know, I think definitely in this town, that's, that's the goal is to write hits for people. And most, I don't know. I don't know if I should say most, but a lot of like big stars that you have heard of, you know, country stars, um, don't write their own stuff anymore. Walking on the sun. Would you say that was smash Mouth's first big hit? Yes, that was that was the one that got us out there, got us the record deal and got us on the radio. Now, you were sitting on that for a while. How long were you sitting on that song for? Well, I mean, the short story, um, I wrote it for the band that I was in before Smash Mouth, and it just got vetoed for whatever reason. It, it could be the production of it. You know, it kind of sounded, I don't know, it almost sounded like Santana or something, who I'm not a fan of at all, and I don't know why it sounded like that, but um they're like nah that sounds like fucking santana and i'm like really i didn't get it to me it it sounded like some old 60s you know jose feliciano or something and so anyway i'm making this short story long um it sat on a cassette tape until our original drummer of smash mouth uh, kevin coleman um found it and listened to it and he's like this is the song we got to play this song and so we did and that got us on the radio. Carson Daly was actually working at a little radio station in San Jose and he put it on the radio and all of a sudden we started getting some attention. And then Carson Daly moved to Los Angeles to world famous K rock. And he took that song with him. And a few days later we had a record deal. Yeah. I heard you mention it. Um, you know, if it, kids in high school, if you're in a band, make sure you have a friend that works at a radio station. And then, <laughs> then For mentioned- sure mentioned Carson as well. Curious, what, what was your intro introduction to music and, and playing and how did you get into it? Were you, were you in um, like a school band or anything like that? Was there, was there an adult or someone that kind of turned John to music and playing? Uh, my parents were always very much into, uh, um, into music and we had a turntable in the house and they were always playing cool music. And, um, my, if you were to ask my dad that question, he would probably tell you that I was playing music before I could walk. Somehow I was banging on something or I was playing a, an instrument of some sort, you know, where, where I would make an instrument out of something. So I think it was, it just sort of naturally happened. Um, I didn't take a lot of formal training or anything like that. I think I took a couple guitar lessons when I was in high school. And other than that, you know, I, I played in a few bands like the high school, you know, jazz band or something. I couldn't read music. I still don't. I just sort of like listened to the song a few times and played by ear. So that, that's just kind of how I got it. Okay. That was going to be my next question. Could you play before you could read music? But you answered that for me. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I wish I could. Is that something that's common? That people can't read music? Very. That can play what really well. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's very common. Okay. I was always afraid to to tell people that I didn't and they're like, Yeah, why would you want to read music? And I'm like, Oh, okay. Interesting. What are you most proud of? I, I know you've you've written some music with your wife, been in 
been in bands all your life. What are you most proud of? If anyone's listening to this show, this podcast, and kind of want to dive into your catalog, what do you suggest? Um, I, you know, only be- right now the Defiant is is sort of like a um a very very proud moment for me because you know I just really feel like it means something. It's it's very important music. I think it's very timely. In fact, I wish it would have come out a year ago, but you know it's it's still relevant and the things that we're saying and so yeah i'm very proud of that and i'm very proud of everyone that's in this band for you know standing together on this and for what we believe in you know we're going we're taking a lot of shit for it especially the guys who got ousted from their band and so i'm, I'm very proud of them and so i'm very proud of this project what uh what songs do you vibe with the most that you like the most? And second part of that, it, was there any fear when you were writing this stuff or, you know, getting the group together that it wasn't going to get her just based on what the climate of things are? Or is that not really a concern because you've kind of hit your goals and done your thing and you just want to write some cool music with some cool guys? I It, it wasn't a concern at all. I, I didn't I don't think any of us really cared if it if it was gonna go anywhere or what until until we realize that it's good you know we're like huh this is actually better than we thought and when we were playing it for other people yeah it sort of snowballed um the my proud songs you know is uh there's one called no nothing on the album that i'm very proud of um it was written by all of us and it's really just about you know it's sort of pointing out the whole idea that in the future we'll, we will own nothing and be happy about it. <laughs> you know, it's going to make us all these sort of zombies just by n- not owning anything, like l- leave that to somebody else. Shout um, out to Klaus Schwab. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you, you will actually, uh, you will actually hear him on that song. Oh, nice. Um, that, that might be a spoiler. I probably, I'm probably going to, Dickie's probably going to kill me for saying that, but um good call rich <laughs> <laughs> but the um uh the song dead language i'm i'm really proud of that one that one came together very well um that's already out so i can talk about that and it's really just about it's it's pretty obvious just about this this device that's in my hand right now that i'm talking to you guys on and how big a part it is of our lives these days and and how we just don't really talk to each other anymore you know i was at an airport the other day and i was just sitting there looking and I didn't see one person not looking at one of these things, including me, you know. And I was just like, man, I guess that's that's where we are. But it's just I, I just really hope people uh, put them down once in a while and and sit across the table from each other and stare into each other's eyes and talk about how shitty the food is they're eating, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you, Greg. I, and curious, I with your road trip and everything, I know you mentioned earlier in the episode that uh some of the folks in the band and stuff they have children and they homeschool them and i'm a, a high school teacher so i i see the the epidemic that is the the control of the phone i'm curious do you are you one of the gentlemen that homeschools um i would call myself a substitute teacher okay and the physical ed pe teacher and the music teacher so i i do all the fun stuff and my wife you know carries all the weight as far as that goes and so, and she actually subbed for a biology class the other day, two, two uh, periods, and she said it was one of the hardest things she'd ever done. High school biology class. So I, I feel you, <laughs> or she feels you. Yeah, it's um, it's a, every day is a battle with the with the Bluetooth headphones and, and the cell phones. Do you have um, have you have tried to limit your uh, your kids' uh, cell phone usage and stuff? Yes, we do. Right. You know, we, we, we're the parents that have, you know, time limits on everything. And, you know, my I have two teenage daughters that live with us. I have an older child that, that's out of, you know, out in the world. But um, our two teenage daughters, you know, they're we have rules on them. They can't talk on the phone in their room with the door closed. You know, they have to limit their game apps and things like that um and you know it goes off at eight o'clock at night and we take 
all the devices because they've learned how to crack codes and get on the phone at three in the morning and all kinds of fun stuff. So we're, yeah, we're going through it. Okay. Well, just like with the, with the Shrek and the song and Shrek, just with the cell phone as well, eventually someday they will both thank you. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Right now they hate it, but yeah, no, they're, they're good kids and they do understand. They're just, they, they push the, the limits like we all did. Yeah, no doubt. What does PE class look like with that? And how many days a week are they getting at it in PE class? Yeah, so it's paddle boarding out here on the um, on the lakes around Nashville. Uh, it's bike riding. It's skateboarding. Um, we have this great, it's, it was an old airstrip. Like, uh, in fact, I think it's the airstrip that Patsy Klein took off from when when her plane crashed and i know that's morbid but now it's just a big park but the airstrip is still there the tarmac is still there and we go out there with all the other east nash billions and just go crazy with uh you know whether they're uh rollerblading or skateboarding or biking and then there's like a little workout area so and they like that they like to get out of the house and get away from their work nice do you find that the stand up paddleboard is that a, a sufficient replacement for surfing? Well, I was always a terrible surfer. Okay. Um, so I'm much better at paddleboarding than I would ever be at surfing. I mean, I can surf. I'm just, I you never aspired to be a shredder, I guess. Okay. Yeah, we uh, we grew up at the Jersey Shore, and we we never surfed, but all our friends w would hate on the stand up paddleboard. But Rich has been out, and he he enjoys it, and it was always one of those things that I was like, oh, I'm a kook if I do that, but it always looks like a really good time. Well, I would never I would never put a paddleboard in the ocean because that that would go against my kook of the day ethics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely something that there's definitely a stigma to it on the coast but um when you're landlocked and you're on lakes it seems to be very popular and very acceptable and and no one's being a kook <laughs> yeah it's a lot more peaceful than it is you know like trying to catch waves and you know territory and stuff like that there's no there's nothing like that there's no territorial pissing in, on a lake yeah no doubt yeah. Greg, we brought up walking on the sun. Are you sitting on any any tracks that aren't published or that you want to get out someday? Yeah, there's all kinds. And there's just not enough hours in the day, I find, as I get older, that to finish these things. And so, you know, some of them are still in my phone as like ideas on, on my little phone mess, you know, those little idea saver things. And some of them are like, you know half baked in my computer or on an acoustic guitar you know and so there's there's a ton of songs that i would love someday to actually sit down and like just finish them all and a few years ago i took a trip out to the desert alone and stayed at my buddy's um airbnb out there and did that i finished songs that i had started and and they turned out to be really good in fact one of them ended up in a film believe now i can't remember which one it was but um yeah it's there's 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 tons of songs they're just kind of sitting there they need to be finished do you try to write every day or is it is it like uh today i'm not feeling it or as a professional you try to show up every day I, I, and i wish i had you know more i don't know what you like a regiment or something like that where i said i'm gonna sit down and write a song right now i just don't have the time at the moment but um, there, music is happening in my mind and words are popping up and I write things down and jot things down and put IDs in my phone all day long to the point where sometimes I have to put on other people's music to just stop my brain from trying to work if I know I'm not going to be able to do anything about it, you know? When that happens, what, what music are you putting on? Let's see, this week I'm listening to um do you guys know what title is no. it's a streaming service it's just like a it's like a streaming service but i really think the um they really get me man <laughs> you know like when you like like a song and then all of a sudden it starts putting a bunch of crap in that it thinks you're gonna like but it's way off this this particular platform 
seems to know what I'm going for. So lately I've just been listening to like a lot of like wire or um, I don't know, the plimsolls, you know, like eighties, I guess what was called new wave back then. Um, or, you know, bands that are influenced by that kind of stuff. I really like Fontaine's DC. Um, what else? Uh, there's this kooky band out of Texas called Telenovela that I'm really into right now. Um, yeah, I, I think that's about what I'm listening to. Okay. So you, you, you mentioned title and I'm just curious to what your thoughts are on Spotify. Do you have any thoughts and what are your thoughts on just the way how artists get paid off of that stuff? Well, it's a shame right now. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like, a, it's kind of like, like the, ele- an electric company. It's like, you need them. They don't need you sort of situation, you know, like if, unless you're Taylor Swift and you can like say, well, I'm pulling all my music down and then they're like, okay, wait, wait, wait. Okay. We'll pay you. But they ain't going to do that for me, you know? So it's, it's a, it's a real drag for artists that, you know, everyone can just like, including myself, listen to music for free. And, um, but I, I do think that those platforms should definitely up the percentage of, you know, what they pay these artists. And I think publishing companies should go after them. And I think artists should somehow stand up. I just don't know how to, you know? Yeah. It's interesting because when, um, what was it? Napster. Was that the one that yeah. um, Lars that was battling proved- with? Yeah. You know, there hasn't really been anyone like that. That's kind of stepped up and kind of, put up a fight and you mentioned Taylor Swift kind of making a threat like that and having the power to do something like that. But there hasn't been much, much noise. I mean, a little bit, but uh, for the most part, it's um, like you said, they, they, we, you need them more than they need or they don't need you kind of thing. Unfortunately for you guys. Right. Yeah. It was great when Lars stood up and, and did that. And I remember a lot of people gave him shit for it and, at the time, I didn't see it. At, I, I didn't foresee it being such a huge problem, but he really did, and he he kind of was forward thinking on that. And so, yeah, he definitely led the way for that. And um, you know, I feel bad if I ever did say anything or think anything crappy about him because he kind of he he's a uh, he's sort of our hero, you know. Yeah. Has it has a resurgence of vinyl? in the past decade or two, has that kind of changed how you guys do things or, or, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we made, we, we pressed vinyl for this particular album and, um, it costs so much to make these things these days. We feel bad about how much, you know, we would have to sell them for. And so I don't know if they've ran a lot of them on this first run, but I, I do think that, you know, kids a few years ago when they started putting out affordable um, turntables that had a built-in speaker and kids, it was like this gimmicky things that kids got into. And then you go to Urban Outfitters and pay $50 for a record that your your parents probably had. Um, I thought that, <laughs> I didn't know if that was ever going to fly and I, I still think it's kind of a a niche thing, you know, but... Do they even make CDs anymore? <laughs> um, that's also probably going to be the next, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I remember people, <clears throat> I was working with this artist that he's like, I want to make a mono record and I only want to release it on cassette. And I'm like, okay, let's let's try that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but yeah, maybe CDs will be, will make an, another uh, resurgence and they'll start uh, selling disc mans again and people will start jogging with their CDs skipping all over the place. <laughs> I don't miss those days at all. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Bell Bottoms made a comeback. Yeah, so <laughs> weirder, weirder things have happened, right? Yeah, no doubt. I do. I have one last question for you, Greg. You have made a career out of making music, which is 
oftentimes a hobby for a lot of people. So I'm curious, you know, you talked about the the paddle boarding and stuff and surfing. Do you have any other hobbies? Do you have hobbies? Lately, I don't know if you would call it a hobby, but I don't have time for hobbies, but it's home improvement stuff. We just bought a house and it's a fixer. And so one of my hobbies is getting on YouTube and learning how to do something new um, instead of hiring somebody to come do it. And I, there was probably a lot of handymen and blue collar people out there right now that would, you know, want to kick my ass for saying that. But I try to, I just try to learn how to do stuff, whether it's, you know, tiling, you know, put, putting some tile in someplace or um, building a new fence or building an actual gate, um, you know, landscaping, irrigation, just all kinds of whatever, French drains. I mean, I've in the last, you know, actually since pandemic, you know, we um, fixed up our house in Los Angeles. We still own it, and it's now an Airbnb. And we made it like this beautiful bamboo garden. It's got a skateboard swing in the backyard. Um, you know, this really cool French drain river, rock river that goes through the back. And I did it all myself just by watching YouTube. And so I guess you could call that a hobby. Okay, so you're the industrial arts teacher too guess so yeah <laughs> the first question i have for you is are you a coffee drinker absolutely i'm just i'm staring at my little you know iced coffee and it's last little gulp and i'm saving it for this question how do you um how do you brew your coffee and how do you take it chemex black do you have a particular bean that you prefer or a roaster yes um uh it's a company called frothy monkey here in tennessee and um the bean is called brute it's the darkest one they have jim do you remember the uh, place that boz goes to weak coffee right weak coffee yeah. yeah have you ever heard of weak coffee in nashville greg no i haven't okay yeah our friend uh adrian bosman lives in nashville now too and that's his his go-to coffee shop and possibly a roaster so maybe maybe, maybe that might be in your area maybe i'll meet him yeah you can't miss him. Was he the athlete? Yeah, Golf he's a, he's, a, he's the um, um, director of competition for CrossFit. So he programs all the workouts for the CrossFit games. That's so cool. Yeah, I, I know who he is. Okay, cool. Uh, Greg, do you have any daily practices or rituals that you do on a regular basis to show up as the strongest version of Greg Camp? Yes, I mean, I do do you know what right when i wake up in the morning I, I do a little bit of a meditation you know and I, I try to get up before everybody i call that the 5 a.m club um i've haven't been that great at it lately because like i said i'm working on a house and so it's normally if i get up i'm i'm sore from the day before and i have to go back to working on stuff but some sort of meditation and plan my my next 24 hours and you know try to stay out of trouble basically is there much trouble to get in in Nashville? There's so much trouble to get in, and I've gotten into a lot of it. So. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right. So you kind of answered this one before, but uh, what are you listening to? Are you reading anything? Audiobooks, podcasts? Um, let's see. I am listening to other podcasts. I don't need to mention them, but um, uh, the Rick Rubin book, you know, I have a love-hate relationship. I have a love-hate relationship with the Bono book, which I put down a while back and I haven't been able to pick it back up. Um, once I got past their early days when they were still a struggling band, um, that was all I really wanted to read. I, I didn't want to go into the rest of it. A um, couple other just kind of, you know, short stories and things like that. You know, Greg, last one we have for you. Do you have a guilty pleasure or guilty pleasures? oh i think like there there is some like pop music that i'm guilty of liking like i really like kylie minogue and i really like um what's that oh my gosh i'm not gonna this is a song from <laughs> like 50 shades of gray or something and i liked the song it's called um love me like you do do you know that song no, but I'm going to look it up as soon as we get off here. <laughs> right. And it started as I just went, wow, that's a great song. I don't want to tell anyone I like this song. And then I learned it on piano 
and it embarrasses one of my daughters every time I play it and sing it. She gets really embarrassed. So, Greg, you're amazing. Really honored and pleasure to uh, chat with you. Do you uh, do you guys have a tour planned for 2024? Are you going to be? Oh shit! I, I, I actually should mention. Um, so the Defiant record comes out uh, Friday, October 27th. Um, we are playing our first show live in front of real live people at punk in the park in orange county on october 5th sunday october 5th um on that bill buzzcocks goldfinger it's gonna be insanely fun so try to make it out awesome well if you come come down down south down on the east side of the country we, we're uh i'm in south carolina jimmy's in florida we're not too far from nashville so um if you make it out this way, you guys are scheduled. Airy Bros will definitely be there to cover it for you. Okay. Um, same for you guys. Like, if you guys make it to Nashville, please give me a ring and take you out to some good food. Absolutely. It'd be an honor and a pleasure. All right, guys. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Greg.